thank you for your patience and our as I've said before, the conversation between classes is always unique. Today was even better. We didn't talk about food even before the morning <laughs> class or between this class. So we're on a roll. I won't say what we've been talking about because it was really bizarre. But anyway, thank you for being here. Tom, thank you for coming back. And we appreciate it. Um, we know that as I asked the question, is the internet good or bad? Tom's going to talk about the great and spacious internet. And I'm not even going to try to figure out what that means. So he's going to tell us what that means. If you'll tell a little bit about who you are again, let us everybody know who you is and have a fun. Go for it. Thank you. Power got turned off. I don't have any volume on your uh, your microphone. Is the green light on? On now, I guess. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I have no credibility at this point. <laughs> you feel free to nap through this. So my name is Tom Pittman. I work for BYU at the current time. I uh, help manage computer systems for one of the largest colleges on campus. Um, I had a former startup that got um, sold and uh, have worked for IBM, the state of Alaska, the city of Anchorage. Almost all my career has been in Alaska. Um, I'm also Native American. My mom was Native of the Clinkett tribe from Southeast Alaska. My native name is Kahuk. I'm from the Dak Tang clan and the Raven Moiti and um, but today I'm here as a computer nerd. So the glasses, they're requisite. I have to, it's part of the contract at BYU. If I'm not wearing the glasses, I can't work as a computer nerd. And today we're going to talk about what I call the great and spacious internet. Let's see. My slide's not advancing. Click on it and then you advance. Oh, the great philosopher. Taylor Swift <laughs> sings, I had a marvelous time ruining everything. I was wondering what kind of reaction this quote would get, especially with that name. I thought it'd be more of a reaction. So I wanted to use that quote to introduce the topic of the great and spacious internet. Now there are, the title for this comes from, um, uh, there are several cultures that have tree of life um, legends or myths, and they include Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, and pre-Columbian North America, along with many other parts of the world. I borrowed the great and spacious internet from a reference that Latter-day Saints, which are prevalent in this area, might recognize as part of the Tree of Life story from the Book of Mormon. Now, in this uh, Book of Mormon, it talks about a great and spacious building, and the building represents the pride of the world. So when I'm talking about the great and spacious internet, that's really what I'm trying to refer to. And this is what it says in the Book of Mormon in the book called 1 Nephi 8.27. Quote, the building, the great and spacious building, was filled with people, both old and young, both male and female, and their manner of dress was exceedingly fine, and they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing fingers toward those who had come and were partaking of the fruit, close quote. So when I'm speaking of the great and spacious internet, I'm talking about the pride of the world, but also this attitude of mocking and pointing fingers at others. So here's a depiction of tree of life art. I don't like this one. And one of the reasons I don't like it is because the great and spacious building is so far removed from where the people are. I don't think that's where the internet is. Most of us have access to the internet. It's not that far removed. Here's another depiction, which I don't like, in part because the great and spacious building has pets. And it kind of infers a certain religion or a certain area of the world for it. It, I think, injects a bias when, when we're looking at it. I'm not comfortable with this art. This art I like because the people in the great and spacious building 
are so close to the people who are trying to walk the tree of life, mingling with them on an ongoing basis. So I'm more fond of that. And then this being a clip from a, a film type piece depicting the people that are in the great and spacious building. So let's talk about the great and spacious internet. Giving a quick rundown of what the internet is. One of the, sorry, but I feel like I was born in a really special time for my career because I got to see things that we'll never see again in the history of the world. When I was born, almost nobody had computers and I got to see a time where computers became ubiquitous and then became connected and then became portable and then became wirelessly connected and then became globally wirelessly connected. There will probably never be a time in any of our lives where we won't be able to be wirelessly connected to people all around the world. We know what it was like before the internet and, the af and after the internet. But the people that I work with at BYU, I have 43 students that I work with, um, they don't get that. For example, someone came in and showed the students a floppy disk. Now, does anyone in this room know what a floppy disk is? Have you ever had experience with it? Guess what the students did when they saw it? They laughed. They thought that we had 3D printed the save icon. Because the save icon depicts a floppy disk, which means nothing to them. In their lifetimes, they have never experienced that. So that was just some artist's depiction of what save would be like. It's just a totally different experience for them than it is for us. So I love that I got to be, as a technology person, a part of this era of technology that saw before and after, and was even a part of of deploying the during on all this. So a quick history of the internet in the 1950s, the internet was born as ARPANET. And it was basically meant for research institutions to communicate with the Department of Defense. So the Department of Defense would give certain universities with strong research money so that they could do things for the Department of Defense. And they wanted a way that wasn't you know, run on four wheels to exchange information back and forth. The first email was born in 1971. And then the protocols that were coming into play, which we don't need to jump into, but AOL, which launched in 1985, made it a consumer platform where you didn't have to have your PhD or be employed by a university to participate in the emerging internet. And then internet um, relay chat, IRC, became a way to directly message people. And I remember being completely annoyed by it. I did not want to be interrupted by an instant message in my workday. To me, messages were something that I would carve out part of my morning and carve out part of my afternoon to go get. I did not want to be instantly messaged. I wanted to be able to deal with messages on my time. And then the beginning of the World Wide Web happened in 1989. And I very much remember that when it was all coming up. Um, and then the first commercial dial-up service, which allowed people from their homes or their places of business to use a phone line to dial into a central place, which would then grant them access to the World Wide Web and to email and to internet resources. I see a lot of smiles and nods. We kind of remember all this, don't we? We all lived through this. So then came the next decade of the internet. The first search engine was born in 1990, the first web page in 1991. Then came the first webcam, where we had an opportunity to visually, in real time, uh, depict images across the internet. The first photo was uploaded to the internet in 1992. And the government was really early to the party, wasn't it? It finally joined the internet in 1993 and started becoming more aware, not that they really had policies for it yet. Definitely latecomers. The first secure e-commerce transaction didn't happen until 1994. It wasn't until 1994 that something secure could happen across the internet. 
And of course, that gave birth to e-commerce uh, platforms like Amazon and other things that allows us to to in online banking. The invention of Wi-Fi happened in 1997. I remember these innovations. Um, and then Google, which is actually more important, I think, than most people understand. Google at the time knocked out all the other search engines because it used an algorithm that prioritized links. So if a lot of people were creating links to the same website, that must be important for people. So that's how you got to the top of a Google search at the beginning. And ever since, people who make websites have been trying to game the system to get themselves to the top of the search results, especially Google's. So then we have this decade, and this decade was the executive part of my career where I was in charge of large organizations and their and our internet use. Um, I remember uh, the burst of the dot-com bubble. I was working, I was overseeing technology for the city of Anchorage. I was in a meeting with all the managers and they were all asking me what I thought of the new economy. And I did study economics at BYU. It wasn't my major, but I had micro macroeconomics. And I gave an unpopular opinion at the time, which by luck happened to actually be correct. I said, there is no new economy. We still create value. We still have consumers. We haven't done any of that. All we've done is change some of the ways that we're interacting with the only economy. And in 2000, a whole bunch of uh, companies that were way overvalued and way overfunded went under the launch of Wikipedia. If you were to ask people, do you remember Microsoft Encarta and Encyclopedia Britannica? I mean, those articles were authored by experts and we knew who was authoring them, right? If you were to say, we've got two choices world. One of them is to just have this platform where any joke can hop up and write and pretend like they're an expert and put it out there. Or, we can give you a free access to vetted, wonderful, authoritative, with great images that were created just for this platform. Which one would win? Which one would the world all flock to? The crowdsourced encyclopedia, not the one that was actually authored by experts. That should have told us what the internet was going to do to society. But I think all of us missed it. We all missed the fall of Encarta and all of these things and watched a public domain encyclopedia like Wikipedia come up. So my space was citizen web pages. Anybody could put a presence on the internet now. You didn't have to have a CS degree. You didn't have to have training in HTML. You didn't have to have any of that. And um, people could have a voice now. It democratized our voices on the internet. Um, dig iPhones and mobile web. I remember very clearly Steve Jobs with his Apple phone and thinking, meh, until he got to the part where it ran apps. And I was blown away. Because now this app completely changes its personality and character. It becomes a way to hail a ride. It becomes a device for doing your banking or for shopping. It completely transforms this thing in your pocket to be anything that the communications technology and creative app developers can make it. And that was so monumental. And then the introduction of Bitcoin. Here's another unpopular Tom opinion. I have been serving with um, young single adults or single adults for a long time, both at the University of Alaska and at BYU, and in church assignments in YSA Stakes. And I remember with a whole group at an activity, someone asked me what I thought of cryptocurrency. And I didn't have a good opinion of it. I said, it's not actually creating value. It's a hyped value. And it's, it's not a value like a corporation stock would be where they can perform and they have assets and they're creating something of value. The only way you can make money with cryptocurrency is to buy it and then hype it to everybody so that the price continues to go up and you sell it. I am literally taking advantage of you. I am taking advantage of my friends and neighbors 
and becoming wealthy at their expense when we're buying into something. Now, the moment um, a government decides to use this technology as a platform for existing currencies, then it's really viable. And I hope that we're going to do that. I know that there have been some countries who have tried that without much success. And I can even tell you probably why they haven't succeeded. But um, there was the introduction of Bitcoin in a whole new way of, of, uh, of exchanging in commerce. And then this ICANN policy changes, um, that was a political hot potato because for some people, the internet should be free and everyone should have access. For other people, they think that some traffic should have more importance and be prioritized on the internet. And the concern is who gets to make the decision? If you're political, you're really looking at an opportunity where your traffic could be slowed or stopped and someone else's could be pushed up rather than an equal access to all that. But um, it became government policy to tinker with that in 2009. So now we're looking at 2010 through 2019. I'm spending too much time on this part, so I got to speed it up. The birth of social media. Holy cow. You know, it used to be that a young person could get bullied at high school and go home to a safe family where people cared about him. But with the rise of social media, that bullying could keep going into the night. And with the rise of social media came the rise of suicides with young people. And all of us were behind the curve. It took so many deaths before people woke up to all this stuff the smart technologies, e-commerce, online entertainment, all took major leaps forward, things like Netflix, online streaming platforms. And now we're looking at the 2020s, remote work and remote learning, especially during and post pandemic, online entertainment, um, cybersecurity has become a new, you may have heard about some critical oil pipeline in the United States that was shut down by an outside entity. And uh, that, by the way, was made possible by Bitcoin. If our government, would, there are only three changes we need to make to U.S. law, and it would stop completely this kind of cyber crime. And I've, believe me, I've written to D's and I've written to R's and I told them I'd write out everything. And we can't get anyone to work on it because the D's are too busy pointing fingers at the R's and the R's are too busy pointing fingers at the D's and no one's helping. I have a friend in Alaska with a dental practice that was completely shut down by ransomware. He had to throw away his computers and shut down his practice for a time before he could stand it back up. And it is so solvable. It is really solvable. The only reason they can do this is because people have to pay these criminals via a method that allows us to not track them, Bitcoin. If we change the way cryptocurrency laws were working, then we would know who's creating and demanding payment. And without payment, they really don't have an incentive to try to hold uh, organizations hostage. It is really fixable, they won't do it. And now we're all worried about artificial intelligence and rightly so. Now, before I move off this slide, I need to tell you that I was doing research with one of my students, a brilliant young man. I'll call him out by name, Trent Entz, because I'm certain he's going to build some kind of technology that the whole world's going to be dependent on someday. He is so great. So we're at BYU, he's got this math, problem on his screen, and he asks AI, in this um, case, it was Microsoft's co-pilot, solve this math problem on my screen for me. Can you guess what the AI did? It said, your account is connected with Brigham Young University. It is against your honor code for me to do this. Exactly. And, uh, but it said, I can give you two other math problems that are very similar and walk you through how to solve those. And that will teach you how to solve the problem that's on your screen. There really are ethical uses for AR if we can get everyone educated to it and everyone over to the platforms that are trying to do it right. 
And by the way, Microsoft Copilot is is an open AI um, product. It's the same as Chat GPT. It's just that it's um, it's can be institutionalized and aware of everything. So one of the things that we were talking about just before I started stepped up is is the internet good or is the internet bad? And most of us will agree that the internet has played a major role in polarizing society, right? My beliefs, your beliefs, that group, this group, that country, this country, everything is all made polarized by the internet. But I'd like to direct your attention to this. And if you're interested in, I know every once in a while you guys are photographing slides, this would be an article that people should check out. The political divide in America goes beyond polarization and tribalism. So you can Google that article and get some of what I'm about to tell you. Here's the first quote from one of the articles of that, or one of the authors of that article. Partisans on both sides have generated coherent narratives. Both points of view are coherent. They make sense to them, which they experience as capital T, truth. This is true. It makes sense to me. It makes sense to my tribe. It makes sense to my group. But they're both generated narratives that they fully trust. Republicans and Democrats have sorted into identity groups that extend beyond politics. These mega identities have grown almost mutually incomprehensible. By that, they mean that if I identify with one group or identify with the other group, I can't comprehend those outside of my identity. They don't make sense to me. Therefore, the only conclusion I can arrive at is they are deliberately evil. Because I can't comprehend it, so their only motive has to be that they're bad people doing Satan's work. And both groups believe this fully about each other. Studies show that each group dramatically misperceives the other. As researchers point out, quote, Republicans estimate that 32% of Democrats are LGBT. In reality, the number is 6%. Dramatically not understanding another group. Democrats estimate that 38% of Republicans earn over $250,000 a year. In reality, it is 2%. Both groups are utterly and thoroughly convinced that they're right. Both groups are utterly and thoroughly wrong, and it makes them prejudiced. So I wrote this article a year ago in dismay, just heartbroken dismay, after another mass shooting. And I went back and did what I shouldn't call research. I should not call it research. But I went back to look at certain points to see if there was any correlation, not causation, between the growth of internet technologies and what we're seeing happen in society. Because I'm not as well prepared for my presentation as I want to be, I apologize, but I'm going to read this uh, blog article, which I posted a year ago because it's not in my head to be able to just freely tell you. So I apologize in advance. Here's a teacher, by the way, who's holding up a sign that says, which of my students do I shield with my body? Growing up in Sitka, Alaska, as a kid in the 1970s, most of us boys brought knives to school every day, Swiss Army knives especially. As for guns, my middle school had an indoor rifle range. We literally brought our guns to school where I grew up in the 1970s. It was part of our school curriculum. We were expected to do it if we owned it. Our middle school had an indoor rifle range that taught us how to shoot as part of our curriculum. Most of our parents owned guns. So there were guns in almost all of our homes in Sitka, Alaska in the 1970s. However, although most young men had easy access to weapons, that's one of the arguments that people make. 
Well, one of the reasons we have more mass shootings today is that there's so much access to weapons. And yet we had more access to weapons in this time and place and the training to use them to do mass harm if we ever wanted to. It never happened. It's not like we young men did not at times feel angry and estranged from society. I'm biracial. There were people in my community who didn't like me because I'm Native American, and there are people in my community who didn't like me because I wasn't Native American enough. In fact, this was a time when racism was more blatant and bullying more allowed, and mental health troubles were mocked instead of cared for. People made fun of everything mental health related, and it became part of how we teased each other. Nevertheless, mass shootings simply were not common back then and in this culture. Now, I'm not saying weapons are not a factor in mass shootings. I'm saying that weapons and access to weapons don't explain why mass shootings are far more common now than any time before. If anything, there's probably less access to weapons today, yet mass shootings have risen. What if access to weapons isn't the root of the problem. What if it's access to the internet? Before the internet, extreme ideas, disinformation, and bigotry could only come from homes, churches, clubs, and peer groups. Before the internet, I could only get my radical ideas from the people I was physically surrounded by. And comparatively speaking, extremism was slower to spread. It was limited in scope by geography, and it was so much easier for authorities to monitor before the internet. Data suggests that the rise in mass shootings parallels the rise in internet pervasiveness. In the last 11 years, prior to the invention of the web browser in 1993, the United States had exactly 14 mass shooting incidents, which averages to a mass shooting once every 287 days. As access to the internet from personal computers grew, there were 41 mass shootings between 1993 and 2010, including Columbine High School. During this period, the frequency of mass shootings almost tripled once every 116 days. As smartphone ownership became ubiquitous between 2011 and 2014, a mass shooting occurred in the United States once every 64 days. And now that almost every young person has a smartphone over the last seven years, a mass shooting occurs in the United States on average once every 43 days. Mass shootings increased 667% during the very same time period where access to weapons decreased, but access to internet bigotry, bullying, disinformation, and political extremism increased. And technology doesn't just facilitate the spread of hostility, it assures that instant global fame is there for the perpetrators of violent crimes. I may go out, but everyone's going to know my name as I do it thanks to the internet. Even when the mainstream media tries to suppress the identities of mass murders, thanks to the internet, the perpetrators' social circles know. So it still gets to the internet, and people still know who it is that, that did these heinous crimes. To be clear, I am not saying that there is a causation, that internet access is causing this. I'm just saying that there's strong evidence that they could be related and it should be funded. And real research should be done to answer these questions. And one thing I know is that the government will not likely ever solve mass shootings. Before the internet was ubiquitous, the USA averaged mass shootings once every 287 days. As I said, now it's every 43 days. During the same time period, we've seen Republicans in control of the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, and they didn't fix it. 
We've seen Democrats in total control of the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, and they didn't fix it. They didn't even prioritize it. They didn't even talk about it, neither side. And when they share power, they're sure not working together to fix this. The government probably will not fix the mass shooting problem. Nevertheless, regardless who has power, there have been zero laws passed to substantively address the problem, whether they be gun laws or internet regulations. For example, 23 of America's 25 most deadly shootings were with automatic or semi-automatic weapons. Something could be done about that, at least. Realistically, I think our best chance at ending mass shootings is innovation in the private sector. And maybe that's okay. Nevertheless, oh, I got that right. For Oh, yes. Realistic. Sorry. I'm going to catch up to my own slides here. After all, if technology is the significant cause, which I'm not saying yet that it is, for the rise in mass shootings, it stands to reason that technology could be a major part of the solution as well. And I really deeply believe that. I hope someone will listen. So let's conclude by jumping back to the tree of life where we started. Remember, the great and spacious building was filled with people, both old and young, both male and female, and their manner of dress was exceedingly fine, and they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing fingers toward those who weren't in their group. I love this quote by Tyler Huckabee. When Christianity is set up as a cultural battle, instead of an opportunity to serve, Others are not seen as people in need of love, but as enemies who need to be feared and mistrusted. Some of us are doing Christianity wrong. It's not us against them. It's how can I help you, brother? How can I serve you, brother? What can I do for you? And as we reach out in that way, Christianity will be more attractive to more young people. And they won't be joining ideologies, but wanting to be good people. The great philosopher, Taylor Swift, sings, It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. Thank you for listening. A few minutes. If you have a question that you'd like to ask about uh, what Tom had to say, I'd like your opinions. You know, we always say that here at Elder Quest, uh, we feel free to agree to disagree. So um, the only question, only comment I want to make beforehand is don't throw bricks because they make a mess on the carpet. It's just hard to clean up. So if you throw things, you'll know, throw money. Uh, Bitcoin, I think you can throw Bitcoin. That would be my first. For Tom, he'd love to have Bitcoin thrown at him, throw food. But what's your what's your opinion of this? What are your feelings? What do you think about what he had to say? Agree, disagree? Belong, baloney, whatever. I I totally love what you have to pre had to present. Oh, thank you. And, but I still am under the I, maybe it's old fashioned, but I still believe that the internet can be good and very, very good, or bad, and very, very bad. And let me say I agree with that. The, imp the internet amplifies and influences. If I'm a bad singer, the best microphone in the world won't make me a good one. <laughs> It'll just make my bad voice get out further, right? So it's taking good people and bad people and making them more powerful in the world and influencing each other. So it's the people that we're worried about. Not necessarily. I've got an audio mixer that can make it work for you. That's right. And I, I was about to say, there's some flaws in that because I have auto tune on some of my devices. <laughs> Not saying Taylor Swift uses that. I think that um, I know this, this is a hard thing to do because I'm not very technical savvy. I do have a little bit that I can do, but um, I think we abdicate our responsibilities to our children by letting them just be on the internet without monitoring and and helping them find their way through it so i i 
I really loved your presentation because I had a definite feeling that oh, the internet, <laughs> it's bad, but it, it has brought us a lot of good things, but we need to help them find those good things and eliminate the things that are harmful. I love what you said. Internet access shouldn't be generational. We should be as involved as we can figure out how to be because it makes us a help and an influence in the example. I will say that as being a part of someone who watched the internet spread, I saw more elderly people come to the internet because of grandchildren than anything else. We can FaceTime, we can message, we can do all these things. We need to do a part of it. One of my concerns, I'm a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In their handbook, in our handbook, it encourages us to participate on the internet. But almost every local church leader I know issues it. They do that. It's like we're saying, we're going to just surrender this territory in a battle of good and evil to the other side because I don't want to be documented for time and all eternity with my replies on the internet. It's it's a too cautious kind of thing. So I loved when President Nelson and the others started appearing up on the internet. I remember when President Nelson appeared on Twitter. I, of course, followed him and I took that screen and I captured it and I posted it to social media saying, I'm following the prophet. <laughs> Literally, yes. I just wanted to say this reminds me of, I think it's our our futures and how we keep, um, I don't know, moving on. But it reminds me of Philo Farnsworth and the television and all of those that yeah. listened to that message. They were upset about, they wanted it to be good for us. Yeah, and then it turned out that we have We've got to watch it. We have got, I love having the internet, but I'm very cautious as to who who do I trust and what am I going to listen to? I, I watch movies and they'll show beautiful beaches and turquoise oceans or beautiful mountains. And I think I would love to live there. And my second thought is, I wonder how I'd access the internet. I, I I couldn't live someplace that didn't have really great fiber optic broadband, <laughs> and and so that that keeps me in promo. I I really liked what you had to say, mm -hmm. and you actually changed my views on some political things that I felt like, oh, wow. you know, I might look at the other side a little more, you know. But uh, I'm really worried about artificial intelligence. I'm worried about it getting into the wrong hands, you know, and. Uh, it, you see what the internet's done to young people with all of that. What's this artificial intelligence in the wrong hands going to do? Thank you. To speak a word about artificial intelligence, I hope we're thinking globally. Because any constraints that the United States decides to do for reasons of ethics, it doesn't mean that China, Russia, Iran, North Korea are going to have the same constraints. Now that the genie is out of the bottle... We have to go full head in to artificial intelligence to be ahead of them. And it's a shame it worked that way if we could have had treaties early on, if uh, governments could have been thinking ahead. That's why from time to time I'd, I'd make a point of how late the government is getting to every point on the Internet. Now we're at a spot where we have to lead so that we can protect what we believe in and be just a bit ahead. It's, it, you know, we had that nuclear arms race and we saw the fall of the USSR. Now we're in a different race that's technology based as a result. And so, yes, we have to keep an eye on ethics. Yes, we have to be concerned about so many things, but we really can't set up a policy that hampers our ability to stay ahead of people who are enemies of our country and way of life. I wish it weren't that way, but that's where we are now. I have a question. How come these absolute, sometimes idiots, <laughs> are getting five to 20 million followers and making a fortune doing stupid things on the internet? And they're young adults or even teenagers sometimes with bizarre, even rated R kinds of 20 to 30 minute blurbs on the internet and they have millions following them and they're making millions of dollars how does that happen how can that be shouldn't it be monitored somehow 
Well, and again, it's because the people who held power weren't aware. They're too busy aiming their cannons at themselves. For example, far more people, I think it was four times, well, let me put it this way. If you take the viewership numbers of the World Series, which is something that for our generation was something that we'd at least talk about in offices and people would be aware who is in it and where it all stands. But four times the number of people who watch the World Series watch a video game tournament on any given weekend. It's a whole different culture. And it's ones that these people are growing up to be decision makers on. And it's just been invented out of our eyesight because we keep saying the internet and technology is a young person's thing. And that includes people who hold public office and that we put into public office. Um, we have to be intergenerational about concerning about this stuff. Even if it means picking up new skills, we all have to be. And then we have to hold elected officials, I think, accountable to all that as well. Yeah. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to get knotheads with massive influence doing dangerous things and influencing young people at the very least until we start to catch our policy up with what is happening with technology. Let me add one more thing to this. Um, when I oversaw technology for the city of Anchorage, the HR director came in and shut the door. You guys know what shut the door means in an office setting, right? Exactly. Either I'm in trouble, especially if it's HR, or something's going to be talked about. And he says, Tom, can we remove solitaire from all the PCs in city government? <laughs> And I said, yes, actually, we could do it overnight. We could set up an automated package that will run overnight and solitaire will be gone overnight. But you don't want to do it. Oh, yes, we do. You know, it's such a bad look when citizens are walking through City Hall and they see all these solitaire screens and all this stuff. I said, I agree, it's a bad look, but you don't want to do this. And we had enough credibility with each other. That he's like, okay, why? And I said, because you can't solve people problems with technology. You have to solve people problems with good management. If we remove solitaire from all the PCs in city hall and around city government, that doesn't mean they stop wasting time. It means you don't notice when they're wasting time and you've made management harder. If you're walking through an office and you see solitaire on several screens, you know there's capacity there. You can give them training. You can give them extra work. You can ask that group that's not overly tasked to help with another group. You can solve people problems with management. Yeah, we have to be really careful about aiming technology at solving people problems because people problems genuinely have to be solved by people in management. Well, this is back to AI a little bit. Last night on the news, they were saying, um, I guess Elon Musk and a bunch of guys have actually implanted a chip in a human and yeah and so how are we doing what are we doing are we jumping so far ahead that we don't know what's going to happen with that and what what possibilities there are i i really agree with you the government is too slow on all this stuff it's, it's acting too slowly but you know what i've had technology embedded with me since 1970 or since uh 2009 that, yeah, there's anxiety if this isn't in my pocket. And if it's not in my pocket, it needs to be in my hand, right? This is how I'm staying connected with my work, with the people I manage, with everything I do. People were making fun of the, the conspiracy theory that Bill Gates had a chip in the vaccine and that we we're all going to be tracked. This knows where I am already, and I'm opting into it, right? Um, yes, technology is going to have new ways of interfacing with humans, and all of it should be concerning and policy should be in front of it. And so far it hasn't been, not since the beginning of the internet. Remember, government didn't join the internet until consumers were already on it and businesses were already on it. Comment? Please, comment. Uh, I, another example, I liked your example of a, a great uh, thing that AI was doing <laughs> <laughs> with that uh, computer problem. Uh, let me give you another example of uh, uh, genealogy. The, uh, the ability of computers now to read handwriting more accurately than we as people can read it. 
that has resulted in, uh, for example, in 19, the, when the 1940 census came out, it took nine months to take those digitized images and start create and get the get indexes up for them. Uh, when the 1950 census came out two years ago, it took five weeks uh, to get that done. And the difference, and it took, instead of two people checking each other like they did in the 1940 census, the computer did the original and one person checked to see if uh, what the computer did made sense. And we may get to the point where that's not even necessary as AI continues to develop. Uh, just things happen so much more efficiently with AI if we uh, uh, used it appropriately. B.H. Roberts is a super prominent historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Most of us don't know the state of Utah. Most of us don't know that he invented his own shorthand. So he has a proprietary to himself shorthand that he used to track what was being said in conferences and things like that. There is literally only one person alive today that can read that shorthand. And she is elderly, and she's kind of not interested in continuing to do it. But she, going back through, because mountains of what he is, is made note of, hasn't yet been translated to English. And she's gone back and checked supposed quotes of Governor Brigham Young and found that what we think he said and did weren't actually, at least according to B.H. Roberts, what he said and did with the ability of being able to quickly capture the oral um, spoken word. In my opinion, someone should be funding an AI project that works with the only person that can read it so that we can now pass along the capture of all this history, which will be lost the moment she passes on or stops wanting to do this. These tools have tremendous ability for good. It's not the tool, it's us and our awareness of it so that we can manage the tools. Let's look at let's look at a positive side. Um, I'm going to use my wife as an example because she's muted so she can't yell at me. She just had knee surgery. It was robotic. Robotic knee surgery. The doctor was watching a computer and a robot was going in and cleaning up her, her knee for her. If any of you have looked at, you know, if you're looking at surgery and things like that, many times right now it is robotic done or it's been done from afar. I'm getting the surgery done, but the doctor's in another room or he close by, but he's not right there. He's looking at a monitor. Computer technology is there if we use it. It's how do you use it? Now, you can say, okay, AI is weird, and I, I always throw out the thing, well, it's Skynet is what it is. It's Terminator. It's going to come and take us over. But it's two sides of the same coin. Which side are you looking at? Which side is it going to be? When he's talking about the great and spacious uh, Internet and you know, good, bad, and indifferent, which way is it? As I asked earlier, is it good or is it bad? Well, it depends. Okay. It's when amplifying you, who we are. When you say it depends, to. what does that mean? Are you, yeah, there you go. Now you, you get it. There's a there's a cartoon. There's an old cartoon, and I'm dating myself on it. How many of you ever saw the cartoon Pogo? Oh go. I'm really feeling bad now. Nobody knows Pogo. Look it up. Pogo. It was a great cartoon. And he said, What did he say about the enemy? The, we have seen the enemy, and the enemy is us. Yep, Taylor Swift. It's me. I'm the problem. We look at me. We look in the mirror. So, technology isn't all bad. I mean, like he says, the, the phone. I know for a fact. There's been many times that I'll walk out of the house going, "Uh, okay, got my keys. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Uh, you're desperate. Okay, where is it? Or I didn't charge it. <laughs> the battery went dead. Have that problem. Or your computer says it's time to reboot. 
and you're going, oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> and it reboots. Who's taking over my computer? What, who's in charge? Who's in charge? I can. I, I don't have a problem with that. I usually will fall asleep, though. <laughs> you know, that's what it comes out to me. But you know, look at this. What's that? Repeat her question. Oh, re repeat my question? Her question. Her, her question. Can you, can you watch a movie without picking up your phone and maybe playing a game or checking your emails? By the way, we cannot multitask. It is physically impossible to multitask. I guarantee it. You can't do it. You're, you're moving back and forth from one to the other. You can't do it at the same time. You just can't do that. So was this worthwhile? Okay, now the question is, what are you going to do with this information? What are you going to do with it? Come on. Come, you're, you're shaking your head. Come on. What are you going to do with this information? Well, I'm listening to it, and I agree, but I go, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know how to make things better. Other than, I mean, I know what I do on the internet. I don't know how to influence anybody else, really. I have a suggestion. Please, Garrett. Uh, attend your caucus uh, in oh. March and ask questions about how the people that are going to represent your voting district uh, feel about issues that are important to you. And this could well be one of those issues. Tom made a good point, and I want to reemphasize it using my words. You have to be informed. We are consumers. You know, I'll, I see, since he's from Alaska, I can say, you know, we're going to sell him ice cubes to the Eskimos, you know, <laughs> refrigeration units, things like that. In fact, I know a guy that made money doing that up there in Anchorage. Anyway, but it's neither there nor there. Be informed. Ask questions. There's nothing wrong with asking a question. It's that thing that they say, there's no dumb question except for the ones you don't ask. So please, I'm going to step past you here. No, no problem. No, no. I just want to say that we need to let our, I want to say constituents, we need to let our congressmen and all of them know that we are interested. And in, like he said, he's written it out. I used to write letters all the time. And now, due to these devices and everything, I actually send emails to all these senators and congressmen, and I'm not afraid to do it. <laughs> Let them know. <laughs> so that's what you got to do. My first letter to anybody was to President John F. Kennedy when I was just a kid. That's I've been doing it since then. You've got to let him, and I think he changed the foreign aid policy because of me. <laughs> my my first letter, my first letter to um, to a politician was to the president of the United States. I was eight years old, and I'm in Sitka, Alaska, and I noticed at the front of the dictionary they had this thing of phonetics, and that there are 44 sounds in the English language, which meant that if we had a 44 letter alphabet we could spell correctly perfectly all the time. So as an eight-year-old, I came up with 44 symbols that would match to each sound. And I thought, well, this is it. And I folded it up and I got a stamp from my mom and I mailed it to the president so that the United States could never have a misspelling again. <laughs> Just like Brigham Young with his own information. Hang on. I'm getting my steps in now. Tom, don't you have a blog on YouTube? I, I have a YouTube you're, channel. and I'm You're always, doing yes. a lot of good by yourself online. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> this is what ElderQuest is all about, learning about you know the, the technology, going where most people that are our age don't usually go. This is a lot more different than, than bingo. <laughs> I'd just like you to send that that message that you had there to every senator and representative and, and politician in every state and every. I'll give a renewed effort. I have to confess that I gave up when they stopped listening. I'll, I'll, I'll persist. Thank Would you. you be willing to share the PDF with us and we can share it with, uh, with ElderQuest? Uh, absolutely. Okay, there you go. 
Now you're going to get something there that you can do something about. Thank you for your time. Hope you had enjoyed this morning and the information from Tom. Um, go have some lunch, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Enjoy the warm weather. <laughs>